Good morning. Thank you. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join the call to worship. No matter how far from God we seem to be, we do not lose heart. For the days are surely coming, says the Lord. No matter how many obstacles we face in life, in the church, we do not lose heart. For the days are surely coming, says the Lord. No matter how hard it is to continually pray and work for justice, we do not lose heart. For the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will forgive and restore my people, when I will equip them for every good work, and when I will grant justice, for I hear the cries day and night. The new covenant God has made with Israel and with us begins in forgiveness. Though we continually break covenant with God, God remains faithful. Confess our sins to God, trusting that God will forgive us and remember our sins no more. Gracious God, we do not keep your word before us always and follow your teachings. Instead, we turn away from our demand and wander toward Forgive us, we pray, for pursuing our own desires rather than yours. Forgive us for growing weary and following you, for failing to pray and work tirelessly for justice, for losing hope in your power to transform the powers of this world. Tune our ears to the sound of your justice. Turn our hearts to your commands and work of grace and hear us as we silently pray. People of God, in Christ we are forgiven and washed clean. God gives us not a, 
God gives us not a second chance, but a new beginning. In trust, let us forgive one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to see all of your faces here. Uh, my name is Jerusha Bacon. And I am on staff here at First Presbyterian Church. Um, if you have not yet uh, filled out the yellow slip in the basket, we invite you to do that. It allows us to give thanks to God for your presence. And for to our friends who are watching online, we invite you to comment in the chat box um, to let us know that you're here as well. I was just writing my name tag when I came up, so if you haven't done that yet, I invite you to put on your name tag with your name so we can call you by your first name. That's also in the basket. And if you have a prayer request, the orange slips in the basket are, are for that. And when the offering plate comes by, you can put your yellow slips and your orange slip in if you have one today. Autumn is the time of year when many of us reflect on all the blessings in our lives and as a way to support the annual crop walk that benefits local food service organizations, the mission committee invites you to pick up a Count Your Blessings calendar out on the way out of worship today. And there are calendars on the table there in the lobby. And if you happen to go through the sanctuary, there are some on the tables in the back in the narthex. October means it is time for our annual silent movie. Um, it's one of my favorite events of the year. This Saturday, October 22nd at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, our own Robert Nichols will improvise a live soundtrack to the 1928 silent film called The Man Who Laughs. Bring your family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers to this festive evening. Also coming up, a very exciting um, opportunity and event is going to be the last Sunday of this month, October 30th. We will be celebrating our 200th uh, bicentennial. And as I've been going through the photos um, and hearing all the plans, it's really going to be an extraordinary day. So you're not going to want to miss it. Um, all the festivities will be here in the Fellowship Hall, and you'll be able to um, observe the slideshows and the, all the things that will be happening after 8.30 worship and then also after 10.30. Is that correct? Jingle, yep. Yeah. Um, one other announcement is that today, after this worship service, uh, First Pres is asking all of the deacons, trustees, liturgists, greeters, anyone who's involved in leadership and serving in some capacity to stay for the safety meeting that will be after this worship service at 9.30. Gerald Summers will be leading us in that as we learn how to keep ourselves safe um, in different types of circumstances. You can check the announcements in your bulletin for any other First Pres happenings. And we're just really glad you're here. Let's continue our worship of God. Let us pray. Holy God, by your spirit, breathe your word into us that we may become living vessels of your justice and love in the world. Amen. The lesson from the Hebrew scriptures, Jeremiah 31, 27 to 
through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of animals. And just as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring evil, so I will watch them to kill, to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say the parents have eaten their sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of one who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another to say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me responsively in the reading of the psalm, Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? He will not let your foot be moved, and he who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Amen. Today's gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, beginning with verse 1. Listen for God's word. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my accuser. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord. This, quite frankly, is such an odd and unique parable. What could Jesus be telling us in a short story about an unjust judge and a persistent widow seeking justice? Once I began to appeal the layers, complex issues began to emerge. To begin with, we have the character of the judge, who eventually is made more or less analogous with God, except that he seems to be the antithesis of God and not a nice person at all. The judge is self-centered, a narcissist who gives little thought to God in his work and really does not care much for other people either. He appears to be proud, arrogant, and is in a powerful position for his own benefit. 
doesn't sound like God, does it? It is also interesting to note that when the judge finally decides to grant her justice because the widow keeps bothering him, literally translated in the Greek, the word bothering means to give a black eye. So the widow isn't just being a nuisance, but she could make the judge look bad in front of others, giving him a bad reputation. Does this mean that it is due to the threat of losing his reputation that the judge finally gives in to the widow? The other main character is, of course, the widow, who has a complaint or allegation for the courts. She is seeking justice and apparently is determined to not give up her fight. According to Israelite law, as a widow, her case should have been more important than it appears here in this story. A law in the Old Testament states that only an orphan would have a more urgent case. In the judicial codes of Israel, God made it clear that the neediest and most vulnerable were to be cared for ahead of everyone else. However, the unjust judge doesn't want anything to do with her or her case. We don't know anything about the basis of her argument or what all she has done to get the judge's attention. Did she follow him to the market? Did she stalk him as he walked home? She could have been making a real nuisance of herself. We just don't know. The context of this passage is a section in Luke where Jesus is being pressed by the Pharisees who are asking him when the kingdom of God will be coming. Jesus responds by comparing God to the unjust judge, but saying how much more just and faithful is God, and God can be counted on. With his statement, Jesus turns the focus from the judge to the widow and her persistence. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This last statement, and yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith, faith on earth, follows from the first statement of this passage when Jesus says that there is a need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said that is what he's going to tell them a story about. He is actually showing compassion and empathy for his disciples, God's chosen ones, who are also longing for God's kingdom. He doesn't want them to become disappointed, to lose heart, to, look, to give up hope. He is instructing and encouraging them and telling them that they need to persevere in their prayer so that when the Son of Man does come, they will be identified as the faithful. In fact, it is God, like the widow, who remains faithful and persistent and will not let us go. So it flips the whole thing upside down. During years of her work among the poorest people in Calcutta, India, Mother Teresa would often travel to raise awareness of what she was doing and to raise money for her cause. In a sermon on this passage, the preacher Tom Long once told the story of a time when Mother Teresa was in New York City. She was meeting with the president and vice president of a large company, hoping for, to receive funds. 
Before the meeting, the two executives met and privately agreed not to give her any money. Eventually, the diminutive Mother Teresa arrived and was seated across from the two executives, across from them at a large mahogany table. If you can just picture that, little tiny Mother Teresa. They listened to her plea, but then they said, we appreciate what you do, but we just cannot commit any funds at this time. Right in front of them, Mother Teresa said, let us pray. Dear God, I pray that you will soften the hearts of these men to see how necessary it is to help your needy children. Amen. She then renewed her plea and the executives then renewed their answer that they appreciated all she was doing, but they could not commit any money at that time. And she said, let us pray. Dear God, I pray that you will soften the hearts of these men to see how necessary it is to help the needy children. Amen. As she opened her eyes, she was looking at now beet red faces across from her as one of the lead executives reached for his checkbook. Does this story, this parable feel a little all too familiar? When you pray, do you believe that if you plead your case well, surely God will grant your request? We've probably all prayed at one time or another for someone we know to receive a healing miracle. What if the miracle doesn't happen? Do we feel that our prayer hasn't been answered? That God didn't hear it? Or that our prayer didn't work? Don't we all hope that God will intercede for us and do what we ask of God? We have all heard people give God credit for a raise, a new job, even finding a good parking place, receiving an award, winning a game. And we've all heard it at, by the winners when the Super Bowl comes around. But th what does that insinuate about those who lose? Are they also giving that credit to God? Those who believe in the prosperity gospel often turn to 1 Chronicles 4.10, where a man by the name of Jabez prayed to God, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from hurt and harm. This is their justification for asking God to increase their wealth and become more successful by society standards. Beliefs such as these follow from an understanding that God has this stash of blessings that are available for anyone who is persistent and takes the initiative to pray fervently. I don't know about you, but I've certainly heard this kind of sermon from televangelists through the years. But don't these seem to be very self-serving and even self-centered prayers? Prayers for something that God really doesn't value, material wealth. Houston Smith in his book, Why Religion Matters, observes when the consequences of belief are worldly goods, such as health, fixing on these things, turns religion into a service station for self-gratification and churches into health clubs. This is the opposite of religion's role, which is to decenter the ego, not to pander to its desires. But what about those folk who don't have portfolios? 
or their portfolios don't increase, or they don't have anything to put into a portfolio. As a chaplain and a pastor, I have heard and met far more people, people of faith, who have prayed for a loved one's health, enough money to pay a heating bill or food for their children. Sometimes we do receive a yes from God, or it appears to. Sometimes the answer doesn't come as soon as we would like. And sometimes the answer appears to be no, or it is an answer that is different than the one we were hoping for. But we can always trust that God hears our prayers and those desires of our hearts, and that it is God who is with us through those times of struggle. Throughout the in the New Testaments, God continues to have everlasting love for us. God truly does not let us go, nor does God let go of all of creation. Yes, we deserve God's condemnation, as the brief statement of faith puts it, but God is so steadfast in God's love that we can trust in God to bring about justice, we can be sure that God hears our prayers, our crying day and night, even though we may not see the results in the time period that we want. God has not forgotten us. God will respond. Of course, we grow impatient. Sometimes we lose heart or lose hope. How can we not? The world we are living in doesn't even come close to the world that Christians have been praying for since Jesus' time. As Fred Craddock puts it, all we know in the life of prayer is asking, seeking, knocking, waiting, trust, sometimes fainting, sometimes growing angry. But we have witnessed God's persistent love in Jesus Christ. So in God, we can hope and we can trust. We are hopeful in a world that sometimes appears hopeless. Praying means hopeful trusting in God, not in ourselves. These are instructions for our everyday prayer life as well. Trusting that God is ever faithful, compassionate, and loving. We are to turn to God with all of our longings, our joys, our celebrations, our gratitude, as well as our worries, our fears, our concerns, our hopes, and our dreams. Prayer is a conversation with the one who knows us completely. Believers also receive gifts of courage and strength from the Holy Spirit. And we are called to be persistent in our prayers. And the Holy Spirit gives us the strength to be persistent. Paul the Apostle encourages us to pray without ceasing. We are to pray for the world, for the church, for others, and even for ourselves. For when prayer holds a central place in our lives, then hope remains alive in us. And when the trials of life happen, and they will, we are able to respond from that place of faith, of strength, and of hope. Amen.
Please join with me that together we may profess our faith from a brief statement of faith. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the Church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all people to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come, Lord Jesus. The writer of 2 Timothy calls us to carry out our ministry fully. Our ministry is most fully carried out when our hearts are full, full of love, justice, and generosity in sharing what we have with others. Equipped for every good work, we now present our offerings and ourselves to God. <laughs> Let us pray. 
pray. Generous and loving God, all that we have and all that we are are gifts from you. Your love is demonstrated in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the gift of the Spirit, our advocate. Use these offerings, we pray, in the service of the justice you are establishing through your kingdom in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We have the following uh, prayer concerns uh, for you to keep in mind uh, this week and also at during our morning prayer. For Lisa and Leslie dealing with health challenges and their families. For Mary uh, getting chemotherapy and for her family. For Charlene and Kathy both in hospice care for Connie dealing with uh, pain and injuries after a car accident. For all our friends and members who are uh, live alone or in residential facilities. For all who struggle with mental health issues. For all in our congregation who are grieving. That God will be with us as the congregation and, and its leaders participate in training for emergency situations. Prayers of gratitude for uh, all who serve our church. And gratitude that Reagan is now okay despite a car accident this week. And in gratitude for the beautiful autumn weather. We'll have. Are there other prayer concerns? Yes. Uh, I'm your friends of. Dr. Alice Arcori, okay. Prayers for Alice Arcori and her family and friends. Uh, others? Let us pray. We bless you, O oh God, for your power in mighty deeds and your power in tender mercies. We bless you, O oh God, for your watchful care in places of exile and at home. We bless you, O oh God, for your human presence in sickness and in brokenness. We pray to you, O oh God, for the needs of our world, for those enslaved by political, military, and social oppression, for those suffering from violence and illness we can prevent, for those at risk for, for, from famine, drought, and natural disasters. We pray to you, O oh God, for the renewing of creation, for an end to harmful habits and willful ruin, for heightened care for species at risk for more faithful stewardship among us toward Earth's resources. We pray to you, O oh God, for the cares of our community, for those who have lost jobs, homes, and hope, for those who are hungry today and will be again tomorrow for those troubled in mind, body, or spirit, and for those recovering. We pray, O oh God, for the cares that we hold today, this day, for patients in difficulty, for renewal of commitment, for grace to forgive ourselves or another, for perseverance in prayer. Eternal One, heal us, we pray, 
in our diseases, estrangements, and in the broken places of our lives. May we return to you, to creation, and to community in joy and thanksgiving according to your grace. Give our church fresh courage and bold vision in this changing time as we pray for the welfare of all people in the name of the one who came to heal and to save, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. nothing more than a conversation with the one who loves us and knows us completely. Let us go forth in the joy of knowing that God's love is with us. And may the love of God, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest in a with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.